Hello. Good afternoon from Keshte, a very nice city in like Balaton in Hungary, where we're having this um, conference of the European Lots Families Federation. And we have organized, as you know, this side event. I would say as a real challenge because we want it to be a registered event of the Conference of, on the Future of Europe, but also an event during the high level political forum organized by the United Nations every year during these days. And also as part of the preparation for the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family, which will happen in 2024. For such a challenge, we thought the best idea would be to have young, energetic, active people who can talk about the future, because this is what we're going to deal with today the future of Europe and how mega trends will affect the families. I am Ignacio Socias, uh, Director of International Relations of the International Federation for Family Development. And I, I may be energetic, but I'm not young, definitely. I will just shut up after this introduction and leave the floor to all the speakers. The first one is going to be Stan Sikko from Poland. He's Master of Law, Master of Finance and Accounting, Master of some other things also. He's really a talented guy. Uh, and you'll see how he can in less than 10 minutes, explain to us what was seen in the conference we had in Brussels last year, just before the pandemic, on youth transitions and the difficulties that young people find nowadays to be really socially integrated. So here we have Stan, Good afternoon. Hello, Stan. everyone. Good afternoon. And with this, I'll I'll leave you the floor. Just I'll show your presentation whenever you want okay. to change the slide. Please let me know. Okay, I will let you know. Okay, so my presentation is as Ignacio said about youth transition and what was already discussed in on a conference in Brussels last year. So we can go to the first slide. Ignacio, can you go to the next slide? Okay, thank you. So at the beginning, the background of uh, youth transition. In the 20th century, there was a econom major economic reconstruction in which governments encouraged young people to complete secondary schools. And so much of the people went to further education, which also resulted in, uh, in uh, bigger unemployment and underemployment of youth, but also in more educated labor force. And in 20th century, there was three traditional uh, transitions, first of which was school to work. It's a transition when after finishing the minimum uh, required years of uh, learning in school, young people immediate, immediately goes to work. 
and it was first type of transition. Second transition was housing tra transition, in which young people uh, leave family home and set up a place on their own. And it was mainly possible because of a steady job, steady career, and young youth have a money to save, to plan something like moving to their own house. And third transition was a family transition. And it's a transition when young people move out of their parents, uh, siblings, and move with their own family to live with their spouse, husband, wife. And recently, the traditional transitions have transformed in the past 30 years, to say so. And it is now much more complex and is taking much more longer for youth to go through these free transitions, meaning that four of five people nowadays are going into further education after secondary schools, and as a as a result of this youth is more dependent on their parents because one on one in three young person go to university and they don't have money on their own, they don't earn mainly, they are just dependent on their families. And the traditional housing transition is has also changed a lot. It is like very hard to save money by ourselves to move the house at the appropriate age that it should be done. And when young people move out of the house, it's not usually with a husband, wife to set up a family. It's usually with friends or alone or go to university and then rent some some flats, so that also change. So in conclusion, people are required to navigate in much more complex transition terrain than it was 30 years ago. Okay, Ignacio, we can go to the next slide. We are going now to the recommendation of the last conference so about the work-life balance. It is basically about finding a balance between personal life and professional life. To make it possible, there should be topics in schools and on local level with attention to the to the subjects about formation of family and about the role of uh, parents, father and mother. It could be in universities, but more importantly in the secondary schools, just to learn how, how to behave and what to expect in further Further, further years about adequate housing. This is a right for every person to have a safe house and safe community in which we should live in peace and dignity. And to gain this, there is a recommendation of more progressive tax system for youth especially and for it could be connected with house, housing community. Uh, and this will benefit young, young people to save costs and to have money to basic um, expenses, costs related with living on their own and having a 
family on their own. And these houses should at least have drinking water, energy for house use, utilities, heating, lighting, the location shouldn't be polluted. So like this, we should be able to afford basic, but good to live in and set up a new family house and decent jobs and underemployment. The basic recommendation is to linking schools and universities with employers. So for example, internships, even unpaid internships for all secondary schools and universities to have partnerships with employers to implement effective earlier career guidance to be able to start career and earn money quicker and not just learn at university theory but also to learn something that we can actually do just after finishing university and also it is important to provide opportunity opportunities for disadvantaged youth to encourage entrepreneurs with, for example, tax benefits and lightning opportunities for to hire more youth. And we can go to the third slide. Financial difficulties. About financial difficulties, there should be in schools lessons about financial education, how to save, how to generate money, and there should be whole school programs and policy that were that will be implying the importance of such lessons because many of the youth still faces barriers in accessing to financial services, also restrictions in legal and regulatory environment and low financial capabilities. And adapting the system and finding ways to overcome these barriers will be crucial in you know, further, uh, further, like, the further parts to overcome financial difficulties. So we should uh, think about ways how to implement this into the system of, uh, of social policies, for example. And the next part is social policies and social integration. And it's a problem with not enough access to labor market. Young people have to face challenge with longer transition to autonomous life. And our recommendation was to guarantee a social protection package, which should include universal entitlements to basic income grants and it shouldn't be conditioned with employment status. So whether you are working or not, you should be entitled for a social package, access to new technologies, the new complex social environment. We are living now is changing quickly and the information society all the new uh, all the new technologies there shouldn't be only designed for everyone but they should also be designed uh, by everyone meaning that users must be integrated in this process also as actors designing and implementing solutions. 
about inequalities linked to education. It's, to be honest, quite essential because it helps with economic growth, poverty reduction, gender equalities, public health, conflict re resolutions. So we need a consensus to which education indicators, uh, data sources that should be emphasized and we should ensure that everyone can accelerate and sustain good education to, um, to be able to gain all the recommendations about all the other parts of transition. Because without education, there will be, it will be very hard, for example, to have financial, to overcome financial difficulties, to be able to uh, work in new technologies and be autonomous on your life. Okay, next slide. Thank you for attention. That's all from me. That we're going from uh, Poland to Estonia, and we have our next speaker, Kate Rang, who's master at the University of School of Economics and Management in Lund, Sweden and also Head of Communications and Marketing at the Estonian Association of Large Families. Let me remind you also that 10 minutes should be like the maximum time you should speak so that we can have um, some uh, time after for questions. Geta, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. And I hope that everyone who are attending the event are having a good day. So I'm Gette Rang from Estonia. Uh, Ignacio, if you could uh, put on the first slide, please. Thank you, here it is. So today I'm going to talk about demographic challenges in Europe. And I would try to answer to the question, what should be done in the future to help uh, European families? So let's go to the next slide. Sorry, I have a little typo here. Uh, it should be population sustainability. But uh, the biggest challenge nowadays is actually to sustain the population. It is most affected by the birth rate. We need to scale up, as can be seen from the graph on the right, the birth rate, uh, birth rate has been declining steadily over the last 60 years. And on the graph on the left, you can see the birth rates per woman in Europe between 2001 and 2019. Uh, it is 1.53 currently. But unfortunately, the birth rate is lower than the population replacement rate, which is fertility rate needed to maintain a society's population size, uh, which should actually be 2.1 children per woman. So even though fertility rates vary from country to country, on a world scale, they are declining. And in most countries, women are having fewer children for all sorts of reasons. It might be their personal choice, but for example, they might be concerned about the environment um, as well as cost of childcare. They might have financial problems and they are not just feeling secure to have first child, second child, third child, and so on. There is also workplace inequality, uh, especially in, in women. Um, I think in many, many countries, women need to work harder and smarter to reach the position they want to reach and earn the salary they want to earn. So they just might be a bit of afraid to leave the position for years because they might not just reach where they were after they're returning to work. So in general, um, this challenge exists 
in my opinion, because there are just insufficient support measures. We can go on to the next slide. So how, how far can we actually extend fertility? Um, here on the figure, you can see that the average age to give birth to first child in Europe is 29.3. Um, in Italy, uh, which is on the first place, the mean age is 31.2 which was actually 28.6 30 years ago in 1988. This data is based on 2018. So within just 30 years, the mean age has risen for two and a half years. And um, some studies say that decline in female fertility starts from the age of 35 um, onwards, and decline in men fertility tends to start later and occur way slower than in women. So the fertility rate for men tends to start falling around the age of 40 and 45 years old. So definitely for, for women, time is running. And if the mean age is around 30 in Europe, women have just five years before their fertility starts declining. And it's harder to have children. So with age, not only declines the fertility, but women are starting to have difficulties uh, giving birth having more health-related issues, um, and so on. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. So the population is actually renewed with births, and birth is a socia socially really important issue, but it always comes down to everyone's personal choice, uh, which obviously <laughs> must be respected. But for natural recovery, it is important to have more than two children. However, uh, from the third child onwards, it is more difficult for families to go financially uh, than with the first two children, due to what some of uh, children are not just born. And what important opportunities have been created by countries support and increase the birth rate to overcome this uh, demo demographic challenge. Uh, several countries, of, of course, are offering government uh, subsidies for building a family, but I will give you a um, few examples. Uh, for example, France, even though its birth rates are falling, is having one of the highest birth rates in Europe. In 2019, it was 1.86, alongside a monthly child benefit allowance and the state subsidies taker. Uh, Vance gives uh, parents the grant of 953 euros for each birth, as well as they have the flat rate allowance, which is payable to families with at least three dependent children whose child benefit is reduced when one of the children reaches the age of 20 and is, uh, is still living at home. Uh, there is another um, interesting example, which is Finland. And I, I called it actually a survival measure and I feel that I believe that we actually shouldn't get to that point where we need to survive. That's why we need uh, long-term strategies, long-term plans. So we don't have to deal with uh, a chaos, which I believe has happened in Finland because um, in 2013, the municipality uh, of Lestiari uh, on the Finnish coast began to address its own population gap by offering women a so-called baby bonus of 10,000 euros per child, paid over a, a period of 10 years, which is obviously really nice. Um, since then, nearly twice as many babies have born in Lestiari, Yervi, and it's um, a great advantage as Finland is experiencing its lowest ever birth rates, uh, because the country has not reached population replacement levels since 1969. So it is really a survival a uh, measure that led municipal, municipal authorities to apply um, such bonuses. And I believe that we actually should act before we need to take such measures. And uh, the third example is Estonia, where I come from. Uh, Estonia is also trying to maintain the birth rates. Uh, the government helped to fund the establishment of Pere in 2019, which is a foundation focusing on the family, and they invested 1 million euros. Um, the foundation aims to help uh, ensure the sustainability of the Estonian population and the nation state. So the, the government released a long-term strategy 
for the sustainable development uh, of its population, which previous Minister of um, Population Affairs, uh, Rina Solman, has even called Estonia's most important issue. And there is also a monthly support for a large family. Uh, families with at least three children get 500, 500 euros every month. And the money is paid to families with three children. And this has also started a change in the society and people are maybe more secure to have a, a third child. This has definitely changed the game a bit. And um, on the next slide, I will give you some just some practical recommendations that I believe would work. Um, first of all, it's really important to keep uh, family benefits in line with changes in wages and prices. It is important that the state does not immediately start cutting uh, family benefits in difficult times, which has happened uh, in many countries as well as in Estonia. Um, the reducing family benefits should happen proportionally uh, when a child reaches the age of majority. So not all the benefits will not be taken away from the parents at once. Uh, currently in many countries, uh, when a child Sorry, uh, you have one minute left. Yeah, okay. yeah, I'm just, okay, I'm summing it up. So they should be uh, reduced proportionally. Uh, I believe that family guards should be state budget. Uh, they should belong to state budget because uh, these guards are really highly appreciated by the families. And also my last recommendation is that in the media space, large families are often associated with negative um, such as social problems and difficulties. So even though we have such families, um, it should be emphasized that um, how we talk about the families and we need to bring up the positivity, 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 yeah. So in general, my recommendation is that every government should water the families because only then they can grow bigger and stronger. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Geta. It's been really very, very interesting, all this information. But now we have to move on to France. Rémy Verlick, he lives in Paris, but he's not in Paris now. I know he's on holidays in the south coast, probably enjoying, but ready to talk to us about this focus group we organized on new technologies in January. He was the rapporteur of it. Uh, Remy, he has studied politics and international relations at the Institut d'études politiques de Lille and the University of Kent. And as I said, he was the rapporteur of this focus group. Remy, you, you have the floor. Thank you, Ignacio. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, actually, yeah, I'm in holidays in the south of France, and I wish you could hear uh, the crickets outside, just like me right now. Um, you can share the first slide, dear Ignacio, if you want. Uh, my name is Remy Verlick, indeed. Very happy to see you all. I'll gladly give you a presentation about the focus group IFFD International gathered on the topic of families and modern technologies on the 21st of January 2021, earlier this year. So moving on to slide two, I will explain why this topic, the impact of new technologies on families has been featured as one of the mega trends suggested indeed by the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, UNDESA, for those who know, uh, for the preparations and celebration of the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family in 2024. Organizing this focus group, we wanted to understand better all the different aspects of this topic so that we could produce recommendations that could be validated by experts and confirmed by the families we are in contact with along the world and other global NGOs as part of the proposals of the, for, for the anniversary, especially of those who will be included in the civil society declaration IFFD is promoting on the occasion of that anniversary. So, Moving to slide three, um, we gathered a group of experts who are active in a variety of fields related to families and new technologies. 
so that we could derive the central elements of our advocacy work on this topic from their opinions. A questionnaire with nine questions was previously sent to all invited experts and then an online meeting consisting of the replies from each expert to each question uh, took place and their answers were expected not to exceed two minutes each, each question. So we transcripted the results of the meeting, including uh, sorry, we, we transcripted the results of the meeting and, and, and this is including the final publication uh, together with final recommendation based on the points they raised. So the nine people we gathered are Matt Brossard, Chief of Research and Education and Development Unit at UNICEF, Office of Research in Ascenti in Florence, Italy. Tracy Burns, Senior Analyst at the Center for Educational Research and Innovation at OECD, Paris, France. Amina Fazlala, Equity Policy Council at Common Sense Media, Washington DC, USA. Tom Harrison, Reader and Program Director at the School of Education, University of Birmingham, UK. Jessica Navarro, Research Assistant, Human Development and Family Studies, University of North Carolina, Greensboro, USA. Lucy Pfeiffer, who is uh, watching, I think. Hello, Lucy. Uh, she's a pediatrician, doctor in child and adolescent health, psychologist in Curitiba, Brazil. Janice Richardson from Insight, international advisor on literacy, rights and democracy, who is based in Luxembourg. Pierre Verlick, CEO of Pop School, based in Paris, France. And finally, Susan Walker, an associate professor in family social science uh, and also the founder of Parentopia Project, University of Minnesota, Minneapolis, USA. So moving to slide four, what we can observe and what drove our questions to the, to the experts is that over the past 40 years, information and communication technologies have transformed the way we work, the nature of learning and education, and the methods by which we achieve personal and collective goals. Parents, grandparents, children, and the range of loved ones who form part of the modern family today face new and challenging choices about technology use, access, and control. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown how much we can depend on the use of technologies and how they can affect our lives. This increasing reliance on digital technologies has created intense pressures and opportunities for families. Digitization, for example, presents new threats to the financial security of many families by making them more vulnerable to surveillance and discrimination in the marketplace. At the same time, technologies are providing important connections as families scattered across the globe stay connected and engage in remote caregiving. Researchers, policymakers, popular pundits and journalists often note that digital technologies have the power to disrupt personal relationships and deliver uninvited content. This anxiety centers on the impact that new technologies can have on the well-being of children and on the strength and social cohesion of family. The anytime, anywhere access to internet-enabled technologies has produced a thicket of benefits and dangers that families struggle to navigate. There are also great disparities in how families use technology, whether merely for entertainment or for social and educational betterment. The effects of new technology vary widely across socioeconomic and other divides. These technologies will continue to play uh, an integral role in families' life choices and opportunities. Today, families have no choice but to use digital communication to interact with the many public institutions that no longer accept paper applications or other communications. Public assistance programs have increasingly become smart, meaning participants are now more likely to interact with an algorithmically trained virtual assistant rather than a real human caseworker. Caregivers must also contend with digital systems in schools and elsewhere as learning processes become computer driven. So moving to slide uh, 
five, I will disclose the four recommendations, four of the recommendations that uh, this, uh, the, 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 the focus group participants made. Uh, first, uh, we highly recommend that access to the internet should become a human right and the appropriate instruments should be implemented for it. States should work toward universal access through develop, developing an underlying infrastructure, as well as helping citizens to gain access to appropriate devices, skills, and protections, and encouraging everyone, particularly the most vulnerable or least privileged, to partake in digital citizenship. Second recommendation, there is a consensus on the need for a more qualitative measurement of access rather than broad general figures that can be misleading. Policymakers must understand the gaps in connectivity, infrastructure, but also other gaps in training for families, students, teachers. For a better understanding, figures on access to the internet should be broken down as follows. First, the proportion of households with functional internet access and the underlying infrastructure. Second, the proportion of households with a computer. Third, the number of devices per person in the family. Fourth, family composition and demographics, number of children and parents, age, type of work, caregivers, etc. Five, the type of skills and attitudes family members hold and six, the kind of technologies children and teenagers use and the corollary, corollary threats. Sorry for my English today. Um, third recommendation, policymakers should adopt a holistic approach when considering the experience and needs of all the various partakers in education, like children, but parents, caregivers, teachers, institutions. Uh, this is really the... the the holistic approach that is necessary. And fourth, uh, final recommendation for today, policymakers and educational professionals should promote digital technology as an opportunity for traditionally disenfranchised audiences like school dropouts and, and unemployed adults, for example, for them to find meaningful work. Besides, they should work to develop training and support for the least digital literal students and parents as a means to improve equity. So we trust these four recommendations should really guide policymakers and professionals in their quest to serve society if they care about family well-being. Uh, for a complete overview, um, you can move to the last uh, to the last slide in Yasio for a complete overview of the full report, please visit the website familyperspective.org. I hope I didn't exceed the time limit. Wishing you all a very nice uh, conference and then weekend. Thank you for listening. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Remy. And um, I think we, we could have a quick but very interesting view on, of all the topics and the conclusions of the focus group. Thank you very much. And now we move directly to Netherlands, where we have Mark Sucks. He is a honors student of economics and business economics at the University of Amsterdam. And he has also been young ambassador at the Eurocities Culture Forum on Sustainable City Development at Edinburgh. Uh, Mark uh, is going to speak about urbanization, which is uh, another big mega trend. And you have the floor, Mark. Thank you. Yes, thank you for having me here. It's a real pleasure. And also thank you for the previous presentations. So if I could get the slides, please. There we go. Thank you very much. So yes, my topic is uh, urbanization. And we are going to focus on the benefits and threats of that are coming from it. And uh, I'm also going to discuss some possible uh, solutions on what has been done before and what we could be doing for the future. 
Uh, we can go to the next and thank you. So first, let's just understand urbanization a bit. So an urban area or functional urban area consists of a city and its commuting zone. So uh, you have uh, not only the city, but you have people living a bit outside of it, maybe people that uh, prefer a bit more privacy or uh, just uh, maybe doesn't afford uh, renting options or housing options in the city center. So um, there is, seems to be a bit of a, a glitch with the slides, but uh, I will proceed. So that is what it, an urban area is. Um, now, so we see that 75% of the world population lives in urban areas, and this is around 6.1 billion people, uh, which is uh, really quite a lot, but it's also important to understand that this is growing. This is something that uh, we're not done with urbanization yet, and we are still seeing more people move in. So uh, in Europe, this figure is a bit less. It's 72%, but this trend of uh, growing urbanization is very relevant in Europe as well. On the third slide, if you can get there. Yes, thank you. So this is just to show that um, in Europe, a lot of the population lives in uh, quite small areas. So you see that uh, Europe has these very concentrated area, cities where people are living. And actually, um, this population change or expected population change, I should say, is uh, very much focused on these cities as well. So we're going to continue to see a decline in some more rural areas. And the big cities, uh, most of the big cities are still growing. So if I could get the next slide, please. Thank you. So the consequences that we see from urbanization is that there's lots of great benefits. So uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot of opportunities in these uh, large areas, large uh, cities and their surroundings. So you have great employment opportunities. You also have more entertainment options and uh, have better accessibility with really good infrastructure. Uh, we also see that this uh, infrastructure and the conditions that these uh, urban areas create bring very high economic growth, uh, which has, of course, benefited us greatly uh, with really low um, unemployment rates. We uh, see that businesses are able to uh, really have these focused areas with uh, talented labor and just have a very efficient system where they can uh, grow their own business and create value for society. Um, so we see that there has been a nice increase in quality of life uh, coming from urbanization. If I could get the next slide. Thank you. But we also see that there are some problems. So this lifestyle in a, in a big city or an urban area can be very expensive with a high cost for food, electricity, schooling, and uh, aspects like that. So the... We, we would like to point out that uh, that uh, having this high cost means that um, it's often leading to people moving outside of the cities. And uh, we see that more than ever, people are renting properties, so they are less in control of their own finance. And we can often see a, a poverty trap that forms out of this, that if you really have to spend a lot of hours commuting to work or just have a very difficult condition, getting these jobs because you have to move outside of the city. It can lead to a cycle where you're stuck. If I can get the next slide. And one, um, yes, next slide, please, one more. Thank you. So one thing that has been recently recognized to be a very big factor is uh, loneliness. That urbanization has led to a lot of loneliness, um, which now, really seems like a global epidemic and a lot of these are organizations that focus on health and focus on well-being uh, really put it as one of their top priorities so it's good that there's some attention uh, to it but uh, i would like to disguise loneliness a bit more because this really seems to be a, a key issue that um, is not being dealt with enough so 75 million europeans meet their family only once a month which is a uh, quite high in my opinion. And we see that 7% of our, the European population uh, feels frequently lonely, which is also too high. <laughs> the elderly is unfortunately at the highest rates of social isolation, as you can imagine that uh, it's a bit more difficult to uh, socialize and 
and do activities the same way as before. And we see that um, housing is quite a bit smaller in uh, cities and urban areas than outside, which pushes to people living more alone. And this has been identified as the main cause. So living alone is the main factor for loneliness. And next slide, please. So how can we deal with this? How can we make sure that uh, we can really benefit from this urbanization while also dealing with the problems of it? And we see that one thing that has been done about loneliness uh, recently was that these um, there were ministers of loneliness set up in some countries like Japan and the United Kingdom, where a lot of the policies they set up was uh, paying professionals or paying workers to go help people, go support people that are lonely. But unfortunately, these were considered quite widely unsuccessful, as uh, you can imagine that paying um, someone to to bring this social interaction is, is just wasn't just very uh, efficient or effective in, in making sure that uh, people are no longer lonely. So instead, I thought that it would be way better to focus on creating a, a society, creating a community where uh, people can interact with each other and, and really share with each other a bit more uh, to make sure that uh, we will have less of these problems. So housing is something that uh, we already discussed, that people are often pushed outside of uh, cities. And if, uh, if the governments are able to make sure that... Um, that all kinds of people can live uh, in the cities, where, whether it's a student who uh, is not in a time of their lives yet where they can afford this, or, or maybe someone who just lost their job, that uh, people like this wouldn't have to uh, go away, but can rather still participate in the community and really have this diverse community. It uh, allows us to have a very rich, uh, rich uh, society. Also for families to try to find uh, places where um, they are able to have enough bedrooms for the kids. Uh, it's really important that we can uh, protect all these different groups. Then for social activities, um, we unfortunately see that social activities in uh, city centers and uh, actually in all of urban areas are very expensive. And the result of it is that often people just don't do these activities. So uh, if we are able to provide these activities free of charge or in an affordable manner, then we can make sure that people can still interact and do things together where they can meet and, and make sure that uh, we have a connected society. So uh, some examples of these activities are cultural investments. Um, we have seen that uh, museums have been getting good funding and there are lots of other good projects as well that bring in a lot of people, but also uh, sports activities and there's a lot of studies going on right now too on, on what should be focused on. And finally, to bring everything together, if we really want to connect everyone. So using this housing, using the social activities and using all other policies that the government may use to deal with this, we really want to make sure that people feel connected, uh, even with our differences, even with uh, our different views, to really have this connection uh, where perhaps old people and young students can uh, live together in similar areas and share this uh, energy and wisdom with each other uh, or activities where we can really uh, make sure that these different generations can come together or to really make sure that uh, that families, our families are a very, very strong way to keep these generations together because we have a lot in common and, and to make sure that families can thrive and just connect these different generations it's it it would be wonderful to uh to reduce these uh loneliness figures so that has been it from my side and um i would like you to also spend some time thinking about uh how you would uh, make sure that you can connect with uh, your loved ones and make sure that that we can live in a nice and less lonely society so thank you very much for listening to my presentation Thank you very much, Mark. And we, we move directly to our last speaker. Um, 
was some and a half, just a meter and a half far from me, not not so far, uh, because he's also here in Kessley, and his balas Kellerman he has a degree in international relations at Corvinus University of Budapest. But most importantly, he is the youth delegate of Hungary to the United Nations. And he will talk to us quite briefly because he could do it much longer about climate change. Hello, Balas, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh... I hope everybody can hear me. So I will be the black sheep as I will have no presentation. Uh, my name is Balash Kelleman and I'm, I welcome everybody. It's, it's great to be here with you. Due to time, I will be very brief uh, about one of the most complex challenges of humanity. It is quite uh, interesting that way. So first of all, I would like to ask you a question. Whether do you believe that climate change is the greatest threat to my generation in Europe? I believe it's it's a very interesting question and it shows uh, a very interesting thing and that is on for who because there are many many perspectives about climate change for example in 2019 there were 2.8 million people unemployed in europe between the age of 15 and 24. so i believe for them climate change couldn't be unfortunately the greatest threat they had to basically fight for their everyday life and uh, is there a problem with my microphone, may I ask, about the comments? I don't know. I will see. I will, I will just continue on and maybe you can tell me. Uh, maybe it's better this way, I hope. Sorry for that. It's, it's the 21st century. It's never easy. So one of the largest challenge about climate change is that we are talking about invisible things of course we can measure our carbon footprint for example or we can see uh, how much co2 emission we are making but on an everyday life on an everyday decision you will not be able to measure your impact that that's one of the challenge another challenge is that people uh, see climate change as something unsolvable this is partly because I believe the apocalyptic messages of the media are not really helping to, you know, take action. It will most likely prevent people from, you know, being happy about it. It is so sad that we do not emphasize that, for example, uh, with the Montreal Protocol, we actually healed the ozone layer of planet Earth. And right now we have the Paris Agreement, which is actually the greatest plan for humanity to keep the uh, temperature rise below 1.5 Celsius, so climate change will not have uh, a so-called catastrophic uh, impact on our societies. So we should be a little bit more positive on that, I believe. Uh, one challenge is that we have very limited impact as individuals and as families. Because we have no ownership of large companies, so you cannot just give an executive order for, let's say, Nestle company to change something. And you have very little uh, political influence as an individual, though you can sign petitions and you can do advocacy. Uh, so what you can do is you have to educate yourself. You have to be very cautious about what is uh, what you can do. And what you can do is you can always do advocacy. You can uh, vote green. You can basically lobby your representatives both uh, at home and at the European Union or at the United Nations, for example, to have better green policies. And what is more important even than that is that you have a vote with every single purchase you make. And th this is an area where families can really make a difference. As an example, uh, what we eat for lunch has an environmental impact. If we have food waste, that also has a very large effect on the environment so as a family you can basically plan your life to be a little bit more sustainable which will save you money and also will be good for the environment of course for that you need to be educated because there are not many young people for example who know that the hidden water cost of a pair of jeans can be 1.3 thousand liters so it's nice that we close the tap after you know washing your your uh, teeth but also uh, fast fashion is, for example, a very large uh, polluter. So we can always educate ourselves and school systems can help on that because the main reason we 
educate young people is not only because if they grew up, they will be more sustainable and they will be more environment friendly, but also because children has a very large effect in their families. As an example, if you make a challenge for a family, uh, if you make a challenge for, for the students to bring it home and have it as a challenge as, uh, as a family, for example, to reduce water and see who wins in the class, that will have a large effect not only at the student, but also at the family of his or hers. Or another great project which, ha which has been done uh, in local schools in Hungary is that people received plants. So they, they took it at home and even in a city environment, you can grow your own crops, which will bring you closer to the environment. And it is a great symbol. Another very important part is that uh, if you have family policies that are supportive and uh, not only supportive for the family, but also supportive for a sustained environment. As an example, in Hungary, each child who born receives a tree which will be planted uh, by the government. And I think this is a great symbol of, of uh, you know, having a better and a more sustainable family in the future. The largest question and then one of the most famous question is that whether it is sustainable to have children in the future or not whether it is a good decision or not. And uh, I absolutely believe the answer is yes, it is sustainable because we have the sustainable development goals of the United Nations and we have the Paris Agreement. If we, if we implement those plans uh, on planet Earth, then for example, my children will have basically zero carbon footprint. So the impact will be very low compared to, you know, the standard agreement stand not not agreement sorry the standard saying that if there are more people on earth then uh, what i as a person say will not matter this is not true because in the future basically every people living will have uh, less carbon footprints and less emissions as what we have today so so yes it is sustainable to have uh, children in the future especially because if you have children then you will behave more sustainable because it's then not about just yourself but about your whole family which is uh, really makes a great difference and i believe families are more sustainable than individuals so that would be briefly i'm very happy to answer questions but we also have to get back to another location so for that reason i will i will only tell this much for you today thank you for being here i enjoyed all the other uh, presentations as well uh, so thank you Thank you very much, Balas. And now, as we don't have much time, we will choose three questions. And I will open for all of you the, the possibility to reply. Let me see who else is there. Okay. And okay. So let's see the first question. I think you should start, Stan, but maybe okay. uh, others can add something. But what is the first question? Can you see it on the screen? Mm, okay. I have a... And maybe also Remy can has something to say about it. Remy. That. Yep. Should I should I start? Yes, you can go. Yeah. Well, I, no. It uh, it it has a crucial role in the internet. Has a crucial role um, for youth transition. You know, from 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 being a teenager to being an adult, you know, getting getting uh, good education. The problem that we often see on the ground is that these, uh, I mean, teenagers or young adults have two problems. I mean, either or. Either they know very well how to use a computer, how to, I mean, they are really like uh, professionals, but they have no degree in computer science, in uh, digitization or whatever. And this is really a problem because they are, they, they might be school dropouts or, you know, they, they, they don't benefit the global economy, yet they have the skills. 
So the best thing to do is to reintegrate them um, in, in, in the global economy by offering them a meaningful and recognized uh, degree in, in digitization or you know, any, anything, anything related to it. Um, some companies do that, some schools do that, and that's, that's good for both the school dropouts and uh, disenfranchised people because they gain recognized skills and it's good for the national economy because they need, I mean, not, not the national economy needs uh, these people to, to operate the, the, you know, websites and uh, work for, for companies in related fields. But the other problem is that many kids, teenagers, young adults don't know where to find uh, the online information, the online courses, they are not um, informed enough on where to look at, and this is really something that societies, uh, governments should work on. So reintegrating young people in the economy by offering them degrees related to uh, the digitization of the economy, or uh, informing as much as possible, as many people as possible. This is okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we need to move to the next question, Sorry, I spoke um, too which is about the pandemic, the consequences of the pandemic. I think they have it. It has to do also with demographic challenges. So I don't know. Maybe Geta would like to tell something about it. Yeah, I'm just going to read it real quick. I'm not sure what kind of recommendations he actually means when he talks about the environment. Um, all those recommendations, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm fully on table what he means, but I... Uh, okay, anyone want to add something about the consequences of the pandemic? Definitely they will have huge consequences on in environment, demographics, it is already happening when I talk about my topic. I can already tell that if families were secure before, they don't feel that secure anymore. So um, I'm thinking that we are needing uh, more measures to support uh, individuals, families, first financially, and uh, to have uh, like a strategy to strategy rec recover from from the consequences that the pandemic has already left. And um, one really important topic that we didn't cover today is definitely well-being, especially mental well-being, um, as well as digital well-being. And uh, these kind of topics need more attention and investments as well. Um, I don't know if I went too far from the questions, if anyone has some comments, feel free. Oh, I think that's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Geta. And maybe we can finish with this comment by Lucy about the new technologies and the pandemic. Um, I don't know if you want to add something, some of any of you who wants to add about the role of maintaining contact between people and families but not being enough. This online relationship replacing person to person, face to face relation. I think this is something important. I don't yeah. know. Um, I, would, I would like to say something. Uh, so uh, there's, there's some very interesting studies that show that this uh, online interactions are not good enough. So there's like this small delay that you have uh, between these micro uh, facial expressions that we are doing. When you are doing it online, there is this delay and you don't feel like you're talking to a person the same way as it would in, in person. So it's uh, absolutely crucial to make sure that we can still have authentic uh, human connections in that way. Of course, it's great that the technology is helping us out because we are able to do a lot more uh, with it than without it. But uh, yes, it's important to make sure that also now that people are used to just being home all the time, that we can transfer back into this normal of going outside and seeing people in person. Okay, thanks very much. 
before finishing, I just want to remind those who are following this event in Cassie that we will join them very shortly to continue this discussion, but we can't do it with all of you. We would love to. In any case, thanks very much for attending this event. Thanks very much to the speaker for all the work they did in preparing their presentations and for all the nice way of showing it and, and all the things you said. And to all the attendants also for being here together with us. Let me tell you that this is uh, just the beginning of a work we are doing of this megatrends with young people and it will follow during the in international advocacy workshop we have in September that you know you can see through our website and um, yeah we, we hope to see most of you there. Thank you very much and goodbye from